So hi guys, welcome to the finals crash course series. Um, we'll be covering some renal and endocrine conditions today. So we've got Dr. Rajat Shikanna, Dr. Nisha Sharma, Dr. Emily Crayon, and me, um, Dr. Ashwini Sri. Um, so we'll be kind of going through different conditions together. And we're starting off with Nitish. So if you want to take Hi. Hi everyone. I am Dr. Nitish Sharma. I'm one of the SHOs at Ealing Hospital. So let's we we'll be doing the renal and endocrine medicine today. So let's start with a case study. OK. Yeah, so here you go. So a 37 year old male presents with vomiting, fatigue, headache, muscle cramps since one month and has a background of hypertension, which was incidentally discovered on his routine examination at workplace, which was seven months ago and is the patient is not on any antihypertensive medications. He has got a family history of hypertension, type two diabetes. His OBS are as follows and his blood show a creatinine of 280 and urea of 15. His sodium is 138, but the potassium is 6.1. So what would be the most probable diagnosis for him? Um, if people just want to put the answers in the chat, Mm -hmm. Do you have anything? Uh, there's nothing in the chat so far. Okay. Give it 10 more seconds and we can move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's most probably hypertension macropathy <laughs> given the history of hype, uh, hypertension and the blood pressure of 210 by 120, which is very high. And given the high creatinine and high urea, probably the patient's having a chronic kidney disease, which was not discovered because the patient does not routinely attend his GP. And the potassium is very high, and this might need some urgent treatment as well. We need to do an ECG. Okay, so let's start with an hypertensive nephropathy. So basically, it's, it's the damage to the nephrons because of the hypertension. So what's the basic pathophysiology behind it? So there's an initial hypertension which causes the damage to glomerular, uh, glomerular endothelial uh, cells and causes their sclerosis. So as a result of this, the remaining nephrons try to compensate uh, the loss of renal function. And they do this by vasodilation of preglomerular arterioles. This causes an increased blood flow, which causes hyperfiltration and more damage and more sclerosis, which again causes the attempt by other nephrons. So this cycle just continues. So how does the patient present? Usually there would be a chronic history of hyper hypertension, usually 10 years, more than 10 years. But what happens in clinical practice, we usually find the patients who don't go to their GP and have been like on long long term without any antihypertensives would usually present with a hypertensive nephropathy. So and the, the basic features of uremia are like nausea, vomiting, fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, pruritus. So it's basically a very vague and generalized symptoms. So how would you start investigating the patient? So just basic stuff like full blood count, use and ease, uh, blood glucose levels, uh, urine dip, and in urine dip you would be looking for protein, and basically urine uh, cytology, you'll be looking for microalbuminuria, and on ECG you would find features of left ventricular hi uh, hypertrophy, it's basically because of hypertension. Another investigation we can do, but we, I mean, almost rarely or never do is renal biopsy and it would show myointimal hypertrophy, but for hypertensive nephropathy, we rarely do this in clinical practice. How would you manage this? So basically, how, blood pressure control, ideal blood pressure would be 130 by 180. And how would we do this? Antihypertensive. So basically, nice recommend 
angiotensin receptor, blo receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors as the first line in patients with CKD. And, and then uh, what we can do is we can do a hemodialysis in patients who've got stage four or stage five CKD. We could do fluid restriction. And in some patients who've been dropping their uh, hemoglobin uh, chronically could be because of low erythropoietin formation by the ki uh, kidneys. So we could give them erythropoietin injections and some iron supplements. This concludes our topic of hypertensive nephropathy. Any questions about this? You can just write the questions in chat box. I can't see anything in the chat right now, but I'll let you know if I see anything. Okay, thanks. Okay, so moving on to the next topic, glomerular nephritis. So basically, what is a glomerulus? It's basically capillary loop with basement membrane, which allows the passage of specific mo molecules into the nephrons. And what is glomerular nephritis? Basically, inflammation of the glomerulus. How does the patient present? Uh, it could be uh, a nephrotic or a nephritic syndrome. And let's go, go through with the causes of these. So basically, they are quite similar, but still quite different. So what happens is in nephritic syndrome, it's basically more of a hematuria, while in nephrotic syndrome, it's more of a proteinuria. So what are the causes of nephritic syndrome? Uh, RPGN, IgA nephropathy, Alport syndrome, and for nephrotic syndrome, minimal change disease, which is the most common cause in pediatric cases, membranous glomerular nephritis, FSGS. So basically, this is the more FSGS is the most common cause in adults and amyloidosis, diabetic nephropathy. And there are certain conditions which could present either as nephritic or nephrotic or a combination of both. So basically, would have hematuria, proteinuria, hypertension, and edema. Basically, all of the features or just one of the features. So these are diffuse proliferative glomerular nephritis, membrane proliferative, and post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. So post-streptococcal usually presents as nephritic, but it's no, cert uh, it's no certain rule that it will be presenting as nephritic. It could be nephritic or nephrotic or a combination of both. So what's nephrotic syndrome? As I told you, it's basically a massive proteinuria. So either three grams of pro protein in urine for 24 hours or a spot uh, urine protein threatening ratio, uh, urine protein threatening ratio of uh, 300 to more than 300 to 350 milligrams per millimoles. And obviously on uh, blood tests, you would find hyperbuminemia because of loss of proteins. And this would in turn cause edema. And often you would find that in on the routine bloods for these patients, you would find hypercholesterolemia and dyslipidemia. What are the signs and symptoms? So basically, as I told you, edema, basically because of loss of proteins. So you would see period basically in usually in children, pediatric cases, you would see a periorbital or peripheral edema. Uh, and then progressing to genitals, ascites, and anasarca. And for, you would find fraught urine, generalized symptoms like lethargy, fatigue, reduced appetite. Blood pressure could be normal or raised, and you would find leukonychia. And breathlessness, that breathlessness could be because of fluid overload, which is because of hyperalbuminemia causing uh, fluid to go out of the vessels into the lungs, causing pure effusion, fluid overload, and AKI. Another thing very important is this patient might present as DVT, PE, or MI, basically because uh, nephrotic syndrome is a hypercoagulable state, and this is because of loss of protein T and protein F, and moreover, more formation of uh, clotting factors. Yeah. So what's the causes? As we discussed, minimal change disease, 80% of pediatric cases of nephrotic syndrome are minimal change disease. And more, most common in adult is adults is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and another cause is membranous glomerulonephritis. So these are the primary causes of glomerulonephritis. It means that the, it, there's a basic pathology with the glomerulus, and it could also be because of some systemic disease which causes damage to the glomerulus. What are those causes? Diabetic nephropathy, sarcoid autoimmune like SLE, Joggins, uh, infective 
uh, conditions like syphilis, HIV, hepatitis, amyloidosis, multiple myeloma, vasculitis, and certain drugs like gold, penicillamine, uh, captopril, NSAID could cause uh, glomerular nephritis. So basically, as we see in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, we might be giving them DMARDs, which includes these. We might be giving them some medications for pain control, which include these. And autoimmune conditions itself might cause damage to kidneys. So basically, rheumatoid arthritis is a very major cause for systemic cause for glomerular nephritis. So what would be the investigations? As for any kidney condition, urine dipstick, first line, we'd be looking for bloods or proteins. And if it's massive proteinuria, it's more likely to be nephrotic syndrome. We'll do the urine microscopy and we'll do the bloods, the usual ones, the Vs and Ds, FPCs, plus uh, renal screen, screen. And we will also do some certain tests like immunoglobins, complements, and antibodies. So basically, this is we are trying to find out the cause. I mean, even if you find out the cause, it is basically more for an, an academic purpose rather than treatment because the treatment of nephrotic syndrome would more or less be quite similar. We could do a renal ultrasound. We could do renal biopsy. We, we do renal biopsy usually, but in children, we would avoid, in children, we would avoid this. Why? Because 80% cases are uh, minimal change disease and the treatment for minimal change disease is steroids. So we'll try the steroids first. And if it's not working, then we will go to renal biopsy. So what are the complications associated with it? So as a result of loss of protein and immunoglobins, it could be causing increased susceptibility to infections and 20% of adult cases present, present with these. And thromboembolism, as I told you, this is a uh, hypercogital state. It's basically because of loss of some protein, uh, protein C and protein S, and increased uh, formation of clotting factors. Hyperlipidemia, very important. So what happens is, uh, body is losing proteins, which is causing uh, low osmotic pressure. And in order to compensate for that, uh, liver tries to produce more lipoproteins. This causes hyperlipidemia. Now we go on to nephritic syndrome. So nephritic syndrome would usually present with hypertension and uh, hematuria. So what are the most common causes? RPGN, IgA nephropathy, and Alport syndrome. So what are the signs and symptoms? As I told you, hematuria, uh, hypertension, oliguria, uremia, proteinuria. So it's not massive proteinuria, but less than three grams per 24 hours. Patient can present with flank pain and generalized systemic symptoms. Post infect, it could be post infectious, as I discussed. It could be post streptococcal or it could be IgA. So if it is after two to three weeks of a uh, URTI, it's probably post streptococcal. And if it is after two to three days after the URTI, it's probably IgA nephropathy. So what are the causes? Post-infectious, primary as IgA nephropathy, RPGN, proliferative uh, glomerular nephritis, and secondary causes, HSP and vasculitis. So investigations quite similar to nephrotic syndrome, urine dipstick, send the lamp, uh, uh, sample to the lab, uh, urine microscopy. We're looking for red cells at red cell cast as we're looking for hematuria. Bloods, the usual one, plus renal screen, and everything is pretty much similar to nephrotic syndrome investigations wise. So how do we manage? So management is pretty much safe. So conservative, we'll just monitor use in these and give some fluids. And I mean, fluids need to be balanced very cautiously, not giving too much fluids and not giving too less fluids. So just maintaining the fluids and it's more of a titration. We would salt and fluid restrict in some cases and treat the underlying causes. So how do we treat medically? Give them diuretics to treat with the adiba and treat the hypertension as it could cause further damage to the nephrons. And corticosteroids, very important. So in primary causes, 
it's very important to give uh, corticosteroids be it nephrotic or nephrotic more important in nephrotic but in primary cases of nephrotic you might use some uh, immunosuppression or steroids as well and in later stages we go on for dialysis surgical so renal transplant in advanced cases we could go for a renal transplant transplant as well so in short nephrotic syndrome massive proteinuria nephrotic syndrome hematuria plus hypertension nephrotic syndrome proteinuria plus edema okay so now let's go on with the case study so this is there's a 32 year old male presents to his gp with swelling of his feet and hand and feeling lethargy on examination he has pitting edema in upper and lower limbs and he appears to have periorbital uh, periorbital edema as well so his abdomen is distending and shifting dullness probably ascites there are coarse crackles audible on auscultation of both lungs urine drip is as follows so what would be the most likely pathology so here what you have to do is find out what is causing the kidney damage and then think of the most likely cause for that condition given the age of the patient Let's write your answers in the chat box you got um a c here so we'll just give it a bit more people to answer yeah. just give it about 10 more seconds yeah okay so c seems to be the only answer in chat yeah okay so that's probably the right answer c is the right answer so why do we think of c first of all it's massive proteinuria so it's basically nephrotic syndrome then we go on to think of the most likely cause and as in 32 year old male which is the adult case most common cause is fsgs so fsgs is the right answer that's fine okay okay any questions hi everyone um i am dr rajuk sekhana i am one of the shos in hospital so today i would be teaching you acute kidney and pyelonephritis so oh i'm i'm having a very bad sore throat so i hope i don't lose my voice in between <laughs> yeah so starting with acute kidney injury so acute kidney injury also previously known as acute renal failure i want to stress on one thing before starting that acute kidney injury doesn't mean that there is an injury in the kidney uh it can be like due to various reasons it's basically that the kidney is not kidneys are not doing their function properly that is filtration of the blood so the is like being collected and they are not filtered out and that is leading to like imbalances in the body so that is acute kidney injury it doesn't necessarily have to be in proper injury so it can be of three types renal renal and post renal pre renal is something is happening before in like prior to like any damage in the kidneys it can be to dehydration or any infection in the body or any other system causing problems renal would be like as it says kidney problem and post renal like there probably be an obstruction or any tumor after the kidneys so these are the various causes of kidney as said pre renal can be an infection or there can be hypovolemia any dehydration excessive vomiting any hepato renal problems like any problem with the liver or any like a problem with any other organ then there can be problem with the kidney which could be probably your nephritis and any kidney cancers then the post renal would be problem after the kidneys that would be probably due to stones or like any other tumors but after kidney like prostate tumors okay so the risk factors would be like uh, usually it happens in older age group but again it has necessarily not necessarily i have seen patients very young patients having akis so it can be to other conditions as well like heart failure liver disease like diabetes 
or any hypotension, infection, increased dehydration, diuresis, etc. The investigations for it would be we have to function the see how the kidneys are functioning. So primarily, uh, whenever we are diagnosing AKI, we do it by two things that are the creatinine levels. The creatinine levels are usually raised and the urine output levels that would be low. And we, we can also do like uremia levels and how much they how you how much uremia is there and the GFR would be low in AKI. But there are other investigations as well. We can do full blood count to rule out the cause of the kidney. Like in sepsis, you would have a problem with the full blood count or the urinalysis to check again for the sepsis and ultrasound scan to rule out any tumors, etc. So this is the staging criteria for the AKI. The creatinine would be raised and the urine would be low. And we can diagnose AKI with on three different stages depending on the values. Yeah. So how do we treat it? So we have to treat the cause of AKI. AKI is usually very like as the name says, it's acute. It's usually very sudden. It could have only history of like two, three days. So we have the main thing is that we have to like rehydrate the patient and we have to treat the actual cause, which is leading to AKI. So if there is any infection, we have to treat it with the sepsis sets, which we all know that we have to give patients fluids, antibiotics and oxygen, and we have to take blood culture and out monitoring and lactate levels. Then if there are any potential toxic drugs, we have to like stop them. We have to like the, it can be gentamicin or NSAIDs. Then we have to, if there is any hypovolemia, which can again lead to like kidney uh, AKI, then we have to gain rehydrate the patient. So whenever we are diagnosing AKI, we have to always, always, always think about rehydration as the first cause, because this is the one which is usually ignored, I think. People did, Check, check for further things, but they always don't take proper history from the patient. So a lot, most common cause is dehydration. How we can check dehydration? We can check it with the capillary refill time or blood pressure drops or from the full fluid balance chart, which is obviously done everywhere. And the best is to like resusc uh, fluid resuscitate the patient. And the, we do it with crystalloids, then the colloids. And, we have, and the crystalloids are the Hartmann's and the Ringer lactates. And the only exception where we don't give crystalloids are the abdominalosis because again, that would lead to like further load on the kidneys. If the kidney, if we are not able to like, if the staging is more than three, four or more than three, four or five, then we do refer to the nephrologist. At this stage of CKD, it would be like, the patient would not be having any urine output. Then AKI stage three, we refer it to the nephrologist. Then if you are not able to find why the patient is having AKI, then we would refer him to the nephrologist. <clears throat> I'm so sorry guys for the bad throat. There can be complications of the kid AKI. As the kidneys are not filtering out properly, obviously a lot of gunk has been collected. So everything would be raised. So we would be having potassium levels. And that is the most common cause of AKI, or the most common complication of AKI. And we have to treat it. We have to always look for this whenever we have a patient of AKI and we have to treat it with calcium gluconate because we need to protect the heart. It could further lead to like peri arrest and everything. So please do monitor him for like just monitor, just rehydrate the patient and always look for if there are any raised potassium level. Maybe this is one of the main reasons why whenever we do UNDs for any patient, we always check for potassium and sodium as well can also lead to pulmonary, the complication could also lead to like pulmonary edema or there can be a uremic encephalopathy, though it is very rare. So the next topic is pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is basically infection of the, it's like upper UTI and it is like infection of the kidney and the renal pelvis. <clears throat> Usually we have acute pyelonephritis, which can be due to probably mostly there is a lower UTI and the infection travel upwards. And it could lead, and that could lead to like severe kidney infection. Chronic pyelonephritis is like quite rare. Like I have not seen a patient of chronic pyelonephritis, but it usually happens in like children than the adults. The risk factor is, as I've said, lower UTI, and the most common exam uh, will be E. coli. And then, as females are more prone to lower UTI, that's why they are also more prone to like pyelonephritis. Infection anywhere in the body can lead, like, can spread to the kidneys and lead to infection of the kidney and the renal pelvis. 
then if the patient is having any stones again that the fill the kidneys are not able to like filter everything could lead to like sepsis and infection and pyelonephritis can eventually also lead to aki and then the patient with suppressed immune system having diabetes hiv patient with enlarged prostate again they would lead to obstruction in the filtration and then again infection and the catheter use the sign and symptom like any infection any nephritis any itis basically there's fever there would be so much pain the urine would be cloudy you can also see pus or some blood in urine then you will have very foul smelling urine sometimes if the infection is like very bad you can also have nausea vomiting chills and rickles so this is a question for you how do you think the clinical presentation of acute pyelonephritis be like what are the like prisoners should be usually is it like i'm having any hematuria or like normal renal blood flow decreased gfr severe proteinuria or cost overtable angle pain like what do you think is the most common it is like we'll give them a bit of time to read through and put the answers in the chat yeah You give them about ten more seconds, and then. Yeah. Okay. Can't see anything in the chat. I think just carry on. Okay. So the answer is that all of them are correct. Basically, you can have fit, and. Yeah, I know people must have been confused with the normal normal renal blood flow, but always remember that this is an infection, so blood flow is not like interrupted in any way. So it's yeah, even like pyelonephritis can also infect other organs, so there is no problem with blood flow. Yeah, so all of them are correct. Yeah. So the investigations would be: we'll do the urine test, urine dipstick and culture. We can also do blood test, ultrasound to see for any. tumors or also we there is a test the scan which is like dye or captos the clinic acid scan a uh, very rarely done this is basically to check if a pyelonephritis has lead to any scarring of the kidney which is which is done at very later stage the main aim is to like stop the infection before it leads to this stage so the treatment would be antibiotics uh, we uh, the cefalexin is a really good antibiotic and it can like lead to like obviously it's a cephalosporin so they are really good class and covers like most of the organism and all like covers e coli primarily so it is a really good you will see the results in like within 2 3 days of having it but you have to complete your course so the cefalexin is the best one as recommended by nice at the moment the uh, antibiotics as well like como have trimethoprim ciprofloxacin trimethoprim is a very common one which is also used in lower utis so yeah but as um, females are very prone to it and um, like pregnant you can develop this condition in pregnancy as well so in pregnancy we only give cefalexin the reason is that the trimethoprim is like a folate antagonist so it's teratogenic for we can't give comoxiclab though it is not that harmful uh, some studies says that it can lead to like premature rupture of the membranes and ciprofloxacin as we all know it can cause arthropathies so cefalexin is good and here also like we have hydrate the patient drink plenty of fluid and you are good to go so the complication of it would be it can be recurring if you don't like complete your course so always complete the antibiotic course it can lead to scarring as well but again if it's at a good stage it would be prevented that like, lead to aki it is a like um, renal cause so if it gets clean kki it can lead to abscess formations yeah, and infection around the kidneys so yeah thank you 
Um, hi, I'm Emily. Um, I'm going to talk about diabetes and parathyroid disease. Um, OK, so I'm going to start with a case. Um, so a 56 year old overweight man comes to the GP complaining of urinating large quantities of clear urine and feeling tired. What are your differentials? Can anyone type in the chat anything that they can think of? Obviously, there's one very obvious uh, differential, but I'm kind of hoping that you might th try and think of some others as well. Yeah. Should we give them a bit and then? Yeah, one second, yes. OK, we got one person saying diabetes. Yes, great. Good, always say the most obvious one first. I think the one of the really hard things, especially in like an OSCE scenario, is where you go in knowing what the answer is or... Um, is that anemia? Oh, you get anemia, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, guys, just any differential you can think of, just write it in. There's no right or wrong answer here, it's just a differential. <laughs> Diabetes insipidus. Great. Right. Yeah. Good. So yeah, um, I mean, feel free to keep them coming. Or I'll talk at the same time. Um, so yeah, what, one thing that I found always found really hard is going into an OSCE, especially if you've got this as your scenario and it basically tells you what's likely to be wrong. And you've then got to think of questions to ask that aren't just talking about the diagnosis. Um, so it's always good to just try and think broadly even when you know what the answer is um, so here are my differentials for polyuria so polyuria is abnormally large volumes of clear urine um, so we've got acute diuretics so again important to ask about medications heart failure can cause these symptoms um, hypercalcemia hypothyroidism so always ask about um, the other kind of thyroid questions. Primary polydipsia, drinking too much basically. Um, diabetes insipidus um, and hypokalemia. Anemia also would make you feel tired. Um, I'm not sure if you'd get so much polyuria with anemia, but polyuria is a super, super non-specific symptom because again, and again, it could be that they're anemic and they're also drinking too much water. Um, so just trying to keep it broad when you're thinking about um, differentials. So just some important quick things to go through. Um, I won't spend long on this. Uh, so just to clarify, are these lower urinary tract symptoms or is this polydipsia? Is this nocturia? Um, talk about the sort of things like water and caffeine consumption, um, how much they're drinking, any fatigue, weight loss, recurrent infections, these are all symptoms that you can get with diabetes. Um, remember systems review, so they've also got, uh, well, you may not ask specifically for bone pain, but you might say, are you in any pain? And if they say, oh, actually, I've got all this, my everything's hurting and stuff like that, then you might think more towards something like hypercalcemia. Um, other sort of significant things, chronic renal failure, um, things that put you at higher risk of diabetes like PCOS or gestational diabetes. Um, again, just don't forget diuretics and lithium can cause a nephrogenic di diabetes insipidus as well um, and family history. So you discover he's got polydipsia, polyuria, unexplained weight loss, recurrent infections and tiredness. What other tests should the GP consider? Quick fire. Mm. Guys, just type in the chat. I might just keep going. Feel free to type anything, but otherwise, um, otherwise I'll take up more of your evening. So I'll just keep going. Um, so just bedside things. So in the GP, yes, you are going to want to do an HPA one C. HBA, yeah, one Z, but um, you may also want to do a exactly very good urine dip, really good. Um, 
and also capillary blood glucose um, because those things are going to give you more of a um, immediate answer as to whether you need to be investigating for diabetes or whether you need to be looking at these other tests and doing um, a TSH and um, potentially a calcium as well. Another important thing to remember is to do the EGFR. Um, renal disease is, as you've seen um, in the previous presentation, um, it is closely connected. You can get um, diabetic uh, nephropathy um, and the GFR is very important as to which medication you're going to give. Um, yeah. OK, so same person, his HbA1c is 59. What would you recommend? You're going to repeat the test, give dietary advice, dietary advice plus self monitoring of glucose and drug therapy or dietary advice and drug therapy. And it shoots some answers into the chat. Mm, can't see anything. Oh, got a few C's here. Got a few C's coming in. Cool. Um, so I've, I've been got a B there. Dietary yeah. advice. So this is a bit of a mean question because, well, different GPs would do different things. Um, so C I think is a good answer, but I purposely sort of not tricked you, but purposely put in because um, actually I think that the I, th I would do D. Um, so NICE doesn't actually advise routine self monitoring, monitoring of blood glucose levels for adults with type 2 diabetes unless something else is going on. For example, they're getting evidence of like they're having hypoglycemic episodes um, or they're on multiple medications such as steroids that might put them at higher risk of um, of complication. Well, yeah, um, or patients on insulin. So those are the those are the um, where, when you would do the self monitoring. You can also do it if they're pregnant. Um, so basically, if there's something else going on, then generally you'll get them to do the self monitoring. But with a sort of classic case of um, diabetes, you don't need to do that. Um, dietary advice again, if if the patient was super keen to not be on medication and didn't want to take any medication, then you could do dietary advice um, with a HbA1c quite this high. It's likely you'll offer some medication as well, just because dietary advice is likely to make some effect, have some effect, but probably take, would take a while. Um, and yeah, so I've just got the diagnosis on the next page. So um, so this is so we're talking about 59 HbA1c, whereas diagnosis is over 48. So it's quite that was quite a high HbA1c. Um, so a little diagram. So you can either do the HbA1c, which is preferred, or you can do fasting glucose. But this is generally only in children. Um, haemoglobinopathies or gestational diabetes, um, gestational by diabetes, the, it's, um, the threshold is lower for a diagnosis of, um, of diabetes. Um, if they have, I think you will got this, so basically you know that if the, patient's, if the patient has symptoms and they are um, they have a positive test, then they don't need to, you don't need to repeat the test. They've got symptoms, so you've got a diagnosis. Um, if this was negative, sorry, if they didn't have symptoms, um, you would repeat the test. If it's abnormal, I've got this wrong way around, haven't I? But basically, if um, the, so you do active surveillance, if the if the test came back saying that they don't have diabetes, you would monitor them um, at this point. Sorry for that. Um, so blood results come back. The patient has a history of CKD with an EGFR of 28. What drug could you offer? Okay. 
We've got a few Fs here. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. Very good. Yes, the answer is F. So metformin is, is the only drug that's actually, oh, no, on that side. Um, yeah, um, that's actually contraindicated um, if the EGFR is less than 30. Um, so very good. I think you all got it right there. Um, so I've just done a little summary of the main um, contraindications and everything. Um, so glyclozide, you try and avoid in um, renal impairment. You can give it if it's the best option, um, but generally you don't. Um, but basically the risk with glyclozide um, is uh, the blood glucose. So you need to so this might be a scenario where you give a patient um, self-monitoring equipment for men monitoring their glucose. Um, and then we've got um, citagliptin, which is a DPP-4. Um, and in this, you would reduce the dose if the EGFR is less than 45, but you can still give it. So very good. Next question. 17 year old man presents to ED with vomiting, abdo pain, lethargy. You're suspe suspecting DKA. Which of the following results would confirm your diagnosis? Got a couple of B's here. Yeah, great. So um, B is correct, but the answer is actually E because it's very good. Because <laughs> um, um, B and D are both correct. Um, so in B, you've got You've got all the things that you need. So you've got the acidemia, um, you've got the pH and um, and the hypoglycemia. Um, however, also in D, D is exactly the same, except we've done the um, bicarb instead of the pH. So if the bicarb is less than 15, then that is also um, acidemia. So that is also classifies as DKA. So those are the requirements. So um, the management of DKA, very briefly run through. Um, A to E, strict fluid balance, you may need to catheterize if that's not possible to, if they're not able to uh, measure the urine. Um, hourly capillary glucose and ketones. Um, the ones in red here are things that you'd consider HDU or ICU for. So if they, if their oxygen stats are dropping, if they are their systolic blood pressure is less than ninety, their pulse is increasing, um, then those are all things that you might want that you'd need to definitely escalate to a senior, but possibly would require HDU and ICU. Um, ECG, preferably put them on a cardiac monitor so you're constantly recording. Um, and then you need to do VBG, so that's for the pH, potassium. Um, you can calculate the anion gap. So the anion gap of more than 16 um, would suggest HDU. We don't, you need to learn that, but that's just something to look out for. Um, I've just written how to calculate the anion gap, so that's just there. Um, chest X-ray, dipstick, MSU, um, Obviously, you need to do ketones, but you want to, they prefer lab ketones so on the bloods. Um, and that is most of it. So basically, you're also looking for a cause for the DKA. So often um, infections can be the trigger. So you're also kind of doing a general what's going on here screen. 
but basically follow your guidelines at your local hospital because it's different everywhere. This is the grey book, so this is the St George's ones. Um, they'll all be really similar, but you have time. This isn't, this, we to learn about this as an emergency, but it's not an emergency that you need to treat within 10 seconds. It's something that you've got time to look up and give the right the right thing. So you need to put the, the in two IV cannula, um, sodium chloride without potassium, one litre over 10 to 15 minutes, et cetera. I'm not going to read it all out, um, but just follow the guidelines at your hospital. OK, your bleep to a lady who's very drowsy. She's in hospital after a hysterectomy and she's hypoglycemic. What is the first step in the management? Have a go. Got an E. Got, got A's here as well. Got a few A's coming in. Okay, so A's quite popular. I maybe should have made a slightly clearer question. Um, when I say very drowsy, I'm I'm meaning reduced conscious reduced consciousness. Um, but so again, so it. I should have made that clearer. So if, if the patient was able to swallow, then it's completely reasonable to give a squash. Um, however, in this scenario, what I was trying to get at was she's very drowsy, so reduced G GCS, so possibly not going to be able to swallow. Um, so the answer here was B, which is um, the... Oh, I'll come back to that. Um, so, so yeah, so these are the um, uh, guidelines, well, these are the, the, the um, different management options. So, yes, you can give, basically, you need to give anything that they will take. So, if they're conscious, they're orientated and they can swallow, then you can give these, like, Fresbin Juicy um, things, which are these drinks here. Um, you can give glucose tablets or two glucogel glucogel tubes um, and then you test the blood glucose after 15 minutes. If after 15 minutes the level is above four, then you can give carbohydrates. So that's equivalent to two biscuits or a slice of bread. Um, and then you need to continue to monitor them for 24 to 48 hours. However, severe hypoglycemia is where you've got reduced consciousness. So this is what I was getting at with the drowsy patient. Um, so here you're it's eight well ABC approach um, and then give one milligram of glucagon IM. Um, if they've got an eating disorder, then you don't do that. Um, if you've got if they've got severe hepatic disease, then you also don't do that. Um, if it's not suitable or symptoms aren't resolved, then you can give 10% um, dextrose. Um, and then the same thing again with the carbohydrate. Um, so HHS, so this is really similar to DKA. Basically, the principles are um, rehydrate um, a bit but more cautiously. Um, there's usually something else going on. So there's usually an illness. So do a proper septic screen. Um, and often the patients, um, they've kind of got a longer history of symptoms. So it's usually been going on for a week, they're really dehydrated, um, and they often have very high glucose. Um, but again, follow the guidelines. So um, you don't need to know this off by heart. You need to, the, need to know the principles of the management. But the most important thing you can do when you're an F1 is just to look up the guidelines before you do anything else. Um, you might want to also tell your SHO or discuss with somebody more senior. Um, but you do need to look at the guidelines and your SHO will thank you if you have 
some knowledge on it rather than just going to them and saying this patient's got this what do I do so parathyroid what's the most common cause of primary hyperparathyroidism this is a really typical question which I think doesn't really come up in real life but comes up in exam questions Feel free to have a guess. A. 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 Great. OK, so the answer is A. I will come on to why. Um, before I go on to the next slide, does anyone know how many parathyroid glands we have? <laughs> this may seem like a random question, but how, does anyone know how many? Four. Very good. Perfect. Great. Well done. Good parathyroid knowledge. So. Um, so parathyroid is secreted in response to low calcium. Um, so PTH increases the osteoclast activity, um, releasing uh, calcium and phosphate from bones. It increases calcium and um, decreases phosphate reabsorption from the kidney and also increases the vitamin D production, D3 production, generally overall increasing calcium, decreasing phosphate. So it's split into primary, secondary and tertiary. Very annoyingly, it's not the same as some of the other endocrine disorders in the sort of pattern of how, how it's split into these, these categories. So primary is, um, so the most common is a solitary adenoma. Um, and you can also get hyperplasia of all the glands. Um, and basically this is where you've got, um, you've just, for some reason, you're just making too much PTH. So it's the primary, it's sort of the primary reason for what's going on. Um, so in this, you are it's often asymptomatic, but just a high calcium because the PTH is increasing the calcium. Um, so you can get symptoms of high calcium. Um, so those are the, well, these things, weak, tired, depressed, or as you may know, stones, thrones, bone stones, thrones, abdominal groans, and uh, psychiatric moons. So you get uh, the sort of generalised hypercalcemia symptoms. Um, you can also get symptoms from bone reabsorption, um, pain, fractures, osteopenia and osteoporosis. Um, so that's primary. So secondary in hyperparathyroidism land is nothing to do with the parathyroid um, in terms of there's nothing wrong with the parathyroid um, so you, you have a low calcium um, and a high PTH so the PTH is high because it's responding appropriately to the low calcium so this is where you get um, so this is decreased vitamin D intake chronic renal failure um, and in these scenarios you just need to correct the causes and give vitamin D um, so that's the that's what secondary means. And then tertiary is basically when it's been secondary for ages. So you've got high PTH, you've got you've had low calcium and high PTH, but the PTH, the parathyroid glands have got so used to making high PTH all the time that they keep making high PTH, whether or not your calcium is corrected. So that's what you call, call tertiary. Um, and that's sometimes in chronic renal failure. A um, couple more questions. Which syndrome or syndromes are associated with primary hyperparathyroidism? Another exam favourite. Feel free to guess.
Got an A here. Anyone else have, want to have a go? Got a couple of Bs. Okay. Um, the answer is A. It is associated with both of these men syndromes. So in men type A, type one, um, you get primary hyperparathyroidism, pituitary adenoma, pancreatic tumours, the three Ps, although very confusing because in men type two, there are also some Ps. Um, so men type two is characterised by, again, primary hyperparathyroidism. So it's the one thing that they both have in common. Um, medullary thyroid cancer and pheochromocytomas. Um, and I don't think you necessarily need to know the details between two, two A and two B, but I've put it on the slide for your information if you are interested. Um, but yeah, men two B, you can get this marfanoid um, appearance as well. Um, very briefly, um, just to touch on hyperparathyroidism, generally it's gland failure. So that's again the primary. So the, re the primary is the gland bit. Um, so you can get gland failure and that can present with symptoms of hypocalcemia. And then secondary, you can get things like, again, secondary is another slightly confusing again because it's a slightly different um, uh, mechanism to hyper parathyroidism but basically you can if it's secondary to something then you can it can be due to having a thyroidectomy um, you can also have low magnesium um, which and magnesium is required for PTH secretion so I think that's it sorry I've, I've really rushed through that so please feel free to post any questions on the chat I'm going to go over thyroid disorders first and then I'll go over some adrenal disorders as well um, so I'm Atch, I'm one of the F1 doctors in Ealing. Um, put my email in there as well in case anyone wants to ask any questions um, later on. Okay, so this is interactive, so please do put your answers in the chat for all the SVAs I have in here. And I tried to make it a little bit fun and have a little bit of a theme in here too. So I hope you appreciate it. So start off with an SVA, if my slides actually move. Cool. So, First one, we've got a patient who's had a, re a recent left thyroid lobectomy. They're now complaining of new onset of hoarseness in their voice. Which nerve is likely to be damaged to cause these symptoms? So if you can put your answers in the chat. Cool, got loads of C's here, which is all right, well done. So as you can see, so that's the recurrent laryngeal nerve just going up behind the thyroid gland there. So which is why it's quite susceptible to any damage during surgery. Cool. So the next one, got Wanda Maximoff. So anyone who's a Marvel fan, you'll notice there's a Marvel theme going through here. Um, she's visiting the GP complaining of tiredness. She's recently gave um, birth to a healthy baby girl. She's generally enjoying being a mother, but is constantly exhausted and feels really low in mood. She can't seem to shake off the baby weight and she's gained, she has gained despite her poor appetite. On top of all that, her partner noted that she's actually becoming more pudgy. And um, what's the most likely diagnosis? I'll give you a little bit more time to get more answers. Yep, so you've got a few Ds here, which is correct. Well done, guys. So one of the common causes of um, hypothyroidism is actually postpartum. Um, like you can get it postpartum as well. Um, and these are kind of the typical um, like presentation as well, which I'll go through in a minute. So just to kind of go through thyroid disease and um, in general, so you can get either hyper or hypothyroidism and in this case it was hypo um, and it can either be primary secondary or tertiary so primary being 
how I remember it is usually that the end organ is your primary cause. So if anything's wrong with that, that would be your primary cause there. Um, then your secondary is one step up. So in this case, the pituitary and tertiary would be the, the starting point, which is usually the hypothalamus. So for hypothyroidism, your general kind of general kind of like presentation is kind of this sort of tiredness you get a bit of weight gain despite your low appetite this cold intolerance as well regardless of it being quite warm outside constipation uh, hair loss um, you classically you start losing the kind of outer third of your eyebrows as well get some dryness in your skin depression um, bradycardia and sort of memory impairments are and in um, females you get menorrhagia and then causes here so one of the causes was I uh, mentioned was postpartum but then you can also one of the common causes is usually like iron deficiency and it has to be quite um, iodine deficiency sorry which has to be quite severe um, for it to cause hypothyroidism um, you can get uh, TSH deficiency um, and any sort of uh, like congenital defects and um, any surgical interventions that you've already had for like hyperthyroidism so if you removed both lobes or had radio iodine treatment that can kind of end up swinging you the other way and you'll be uh, deficient instead and then Hashimoto's disease is one of your um, autoimmune diseases which can cause hyperthyroidism as well and the management typically for this is your levothyroxine So next case here, you've got the Hulk who's brought into A&E unconscious. Um, they have a profuse edema of the skin, which is non-pitting, a puffy face, thin hair and very thin eyebrows. He's known to be taking carbamazole. He has been feeling quite low and generally slow for a while and he's been worsening. He has no other known medical conditions apart from um, the hyperthyroidism, no alcohol, smoking or drug history reported. So you've got his odds here, so his heart rate's about 51, blood pressure's 95 over 50, temperature's 36.3, his rest rate is 10, he is saturating at 76% at room temperature, uh, room air sorry, and his BN is about 4.5. So what do you think is going on here? It probably should um, phrase that better. What do you think is the likely cause? Got one person saying A. Hey. Got another A here. Yeah, well done. So A is the answer. So mixed edema coma. So this is one of the complications of hypothyroidism if it becomes quite severe. Um, and so you, you've got kind of the mental state status change because of the severeness of it and um, you've got your classic symptoms of your hypothyroidism as well but you've got this kind of pitting that occurs because you've got deposits of your glyco um, glycoproteins in the skin which kind of just draws in the water and it's usually non-pitting um, and then I've just kind of put this in here. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I thought it was quite useful and you'll have access to the slides afterwards once you fill in the feedback form as well. But I thought this was quite useful and just kind of understanding what the pathophysiology is behind all this to lead to this kind of um, comatose state. Um, and then just going through some of the precipitating factors. So infection, cold exposure, a stroke can also kind of tip you over the edge as well. And any kind of medication such as amiodarone or lithium can also lead to it. And typical kind of other like laboratory findings is you'll see some ECG changes. There'll be low voltage, probably have a prolonged QT. Um, it's probably somehow linked to their hypothyroidism and the pericardial effusion they might have developed as well. They'll be hypoglycemic, um, low sodium, so hyponatremic as well. Um, then in this case, we saw that the saturations were low, so his hypoxemic and also hypercapnic, so his respirate was low as well, so he struggling to breathe. 
And then typical management is just making sure they have some airway support, give them some oxygen, um, hydrocortisone, and also load them with some levothyroxine. And if needed, you can also give them some T3 supplements. So T3 is your active form, T4 is the inactive form. So if they're really severe, you just want to give them the active form of the thyroid hormone. So there's no, any questions there? No, okay. So next question here. So you've got Peter Parker who's complaining of double vision, which has been getting worse and more frequent over time. He's experienced palpitations and is easily short of breath. He has some painless skin changes in the front of his shins and some clubbing in the fingers. He's also noticed some weight loss, even though his appetite has increased. What is the likely diagnosis? So if you guys can put the answers in the chat. Got D, got an A. Any more answers? Okay, got another D. So D is the correct answer. So he's got Graves' disease. So I just put this image in here so you can have a look. So the plainer skin changes is this pretibial mix edemas, which is usually just like this non-pitting sort of edema just in the front of the shins. And it's because of these the buildup of these glycoproteins just locally there. Um, and it's kind of this kind of placky sort of shiny um waxy kind of appearance in the front of the um gens so in terms of um causes and clinical presentation so you got um causes typically being like graves disease you can also get toxic multinodule goiters thyroid adenomas thyroiditis um if you're taking too much iodine um so any kind of drugs which might have iodine and so like amiodarone for example and excessive intake of any thyroxine as well so if you're hypothyroid is um, thyroid and you've been given levothyroxine but you've taken too much of it that can actually swing you to the hypo side um, so clinical presentation so some of what our case had um, other things that you can get is like heat intolerance sweating diarrhea you can also uh, clinically kind of see a fine tremor. So in your OSCEs, when you're doing an examination for them, you, the tremor might not be obvious. So that's why it's important just get like a piece of paper and put it over their hands when they're holding it out. So you can see the paper kind of just uh, moving very, very slightly. That's how you kind of identify a fine tremor. Um, then reflexes, you'll test them as well. Um, and they'll be hyper reflexes. So will be a bit more exaggerated when you're testing the reflexes. Um, they might have a goiter present um, and you can see some palmar edema as well and some changes to the nail, so the oncolysis. Um, and then they may also have some muscle weakness and wasting, so that's why you check their proximal muscles. So, and then in women, you can get some changes to their periods, so oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea. And then in Graves' disease, which is just kind of a bit more um, severe, you can have ox exophthalmus um, or proptosis, so you can see their kind of eyes kind of bulging out. And chemosis, um, so just some swelling around the eyes. A diff a kind of symmetrical goiter is usually quite obvious in Graves' disease. They'll have the pre tibial mixed edema, which is kind of rare because it would have to be quite severe for that to appear. And they, it might be linked to any other autoimmune conditions as well, such as like type 1 diabetes. And it, when you auscultate the neck, you can hear thyroid breweries as well. And in terms of management, usually you start them off on any kind of antithyroid drug. So carbamazole is your typical one. But if they're a young female of childbearing age, you would consider propothyroidine, especially if they're pregnant or considering getting pregnant. And then next step, you'd consider a radioiodine treatment or a surgical removal of the thyroid gland. Um, and then you may need to replace that with levothyroxine.
and then so I think someone put A as an option so it so the, if you kind of leave it and untreated it can lead to thyrotoxic crisis so thyroid storm so clinical features of that is a bit more severe so they'll be a lot more agitated have abdominal cramps vomiting diarrhea they'll be pyrexic as well um, they might have arrhythmias might which may lead to heart failure as well and it could, they could also develop seizures too so management for this is load them with antithyroid drugs give them some beta blockers as well to control their heart rate rhythm and then also give them some corticosteroids and if needed they might need some iodine replacement as well um, just because you're kind of dampening everything down so they might end up doing the other way so you just want to prevent them going into a hypothyroid state So just going through your typical investigations for any thyroid disorders. So you'd want to check their free T4 and compare that with your TSH. And checking T3 isn't usually very typical unless you're suspecting thyroid storm. Um, if you're suspecting things like Graves disease or Hashimoto's, you want to um, do some antibody testing. So for Graves disease, it will be your TSH receptor antibodies. For Hashimoto's, it will be antithyroid peroxidase um, antibodies that you'll be looking for. Um, you'd also do an ultrasound to identify if it's um, a cystic or a solid um, nodules in the thyroid, or if you're kind of looking for any kind of multinodular goiters or suspecting that you might want to do an FNA as well just to kind of rule out any thyroid cancers. Um, and you can also do isotope scans as well um, just to kind of visualise the uptake of the iodine in the thyroid glands and this is um, helpful kind of uh, determining hyper or hypothyroidism and just kind of identifying if there's any kind of um, ectopic thyroid tissues or any cancers or metastasis. So next case here, you've got Iron Man who has got a history of feeling increasingly anxious for the past few months and his vision is worsening. He feels he gets too hot and sweaty even when it's cold. He's noticed a significant weight loss but he has been eating more than ever. He also said he feels like there's a lump in his throat. So we've got his tears TFT panels here. So have a look at that and put your answers in the chat for what you think it might be. You got an A here. Any more answers? Okay, got a D. Got another one. Okay. Okay, I'm going to carry on, just keep the answers coming in. So the answer is D, it's a secondary hypothyroidism. So the reason why that is, is you need to think about the feedback mechanism here as well. So usually with the uh, hip, uh, sorry, hypothalamic pituitary kind of end organ, it's you typically have like a um, negative feedback. So when your thyroid hormone is high, you would expect the TSH to be low if it was primary. Now, if it's a secondary cause or a tertiary cause, so for example, the hypothalamus or the pituitary, which is causing the issue, then the TSH would be high. And because the TSH stimulates the thyroid gland, then T4 and T3 would also be high, which is why everything's high. So I put this table on here just to kind of help go through the different ones. Um, so the first panel here, you've got a low TSH, you've got a high T4 and a high T3. Again, like I mentioned before, you don't typically test T3. It's usually just TSH and T4. So that would be your primary hypothyroidism. So it's 
the elevation is due to the thyroid gland itself, which is why you get the negative feedback and the TSH is low. Then your secondary hypothyroidism means everything's elevated because the pituitary is producing this TSH, TSH, which means that's going to be elevated and then everything else will be elevated as well because it's telling everyone else the, the thyroid gland to produce more thyroid hormone. Then in primary hypothyroidism, you've got a low T4, T3. So your thyroid hormone is low because your thyroid gland isn't producing enough. But then your pituitary and your hypothalamus is just like, there's, there's not enough thyroid gland, um, hormone here. So it's creating more TSH to try and push the thyroid gland to produce more thyroid hormone, which is why the TSH is high, but the T4 is low. In secondary, a hypothyroidism, the TSH is low because the pituitary is not producing enough. That means the, there's nothing telling the thyroid gland to produce the thyroid hormone, which is why the T4 is low. You've got your sick thyroid syndrome, where your TSH is low, but your T4 might be normal or slightly raised. And this is usually due to infection, something which might throw your thyroid function off a little bit. But you wouldn't worry too much about this. But you might want to monitor them because you, you're not quite sure. Then you've got your subclinical thyrotoxicosis where you've got a low TSH and then you've got a normal T4. So you'd want to just keep an eye on it again just to make sure it doesn't develop. So this is a point where you'd want to think about treating um, to prevent it from going into kind of a thyroid storm. And then you've got your subclinical hypothyroidism where we've got mildly elevated TSH, but your T4 is normal. So the opposite of your sixth um, and subclinical kind of euthyroid and thyrotoxicosis. Okay, so in the case of Ironman, he had a secondary um, hyperthyroidism. So that means the issue was in the pituitary gland. And he was having kind of visual deficits uh, because the pituitary tumour was pressing against the optic nerve, which is just sitting here. And this is where the pituitary gland is. So if they've got some visual defects, but the rest of the symptoms seem a bit more endocrine, then you'd want to rule out your um, pituitary tumours. And the typical kind of presentations is usually the, this kind of headaches, visual deficits as well. Um, and then depending on the hormone itself. So I've only gone through the TSH um, here. So you'd get this kind of hyperthyroid um, presentation, but I've also listed kind of the growth hormones, which you'll get kind of acromegaly going on, ACTH, you'll have Cushing's disease, then LH and FSH. This is one of your non-functioning tumors. So you'll have all this here, so all these kind of space occupying um, tumour kind of presentation, but there's no endocrine kind of issue going on there. And then with prolactin, you get prolactinoma, um, so like gynecomastia and all that going on in males is more prominent. Um, so I am not going to go through too much detail with the pituitary tumours, I just wanted to mention this, but it will be in our neuro session that we'll go through um, a later date. Well, any questions with the thyroid stuff before I move on? I'm going to take that as a no. So next one, we're going to go through adrenal disorders. So key conditions, I'm just going to cover so like Cushing's, Addison's congenital adrenal hyperplasia, I'll touch on as well, hypoaldosteronism, and then pheochromocytoma. So I kind of just went through the HP end organ axis here. So this is where it starts. The hypothalamus produces a hormone, um, which then signals the pituitary gland where most of it's um, produced and stored to release these and that goes 
to the end organ here. So that could be your adrenal glands or your thyroid, for example. And then that feeds back to the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, telling it to kind of dampen down their signals because there's too, too much activity going on. And put this cartoon in there because I just thought it was funny. And it's a good illustration of the kind of negative feedback as well. Cool. So we've got um, an SBA here. So after the blip, Thor slowly hid away in his man cave. He tried to get his gains back quickly with some super drug, but it started going the wrong way. So he had centralized weight gain and started noticing some purple stretch marks and felt very conscious of his appearance. He was he also found he was bruising more easily. So what's the most likely diagnosis here? Okay, so you've got a lot of bees coming in, which is correct. Well done, guys. So he's got Cushing. So his super drug was steroids. He was trying to take steroids to get his gains back um, and then ended up with Cushing syndrome. So just to differentiate between Cushing syndrome and Cushing's disease, so Cushing syndrome is excess cortisol um, from the adrenal glands, or it can be exogenous, so steroids that you're taking. Um, and the endogenous causes usually include your pituitary tumours, which is pushing the adrenal glands to produce more cortisol, or adrenal tumours itself as well. Um, and then Cushing's disease is more specific to pituitary tumours secreting ACTH or ectopic ACTH producing tumours such as small cell carcinomas. Okay. So, clinical features. So as you can see in, in the case that I had, um, changes in the body shape. So you get this kind of centralised fat gain. Um, you also have that moon face and a buffalo hump that gets developed as well just because of where the fat is deposited. Um, your skin starts thinning a bit and you start bruising a bit more easily and you can also get proximal muscle weakness and wasting and some osteoporosis that you're prone to as well and you can also develop um, diabetes with the excess cortisol going around and then you can get in terms of your sex hormones you get excess hair growth in women um, you can get irregular periods, um, pro problems with fertility and conceiving and impotence. Um, and then you can also end up with salt and water retention, which can lead to hypertension as well. So in terms of management, so you've got the investigation. So your typical investigation would be a 24-hour urinary cortisol. You can do a midnight salivary cortisol as well, but I think the standard one that we use is using a dexamethasone suppression test overnight. So you give them a low dose of one milligram and then you check the cortisol levels typically around 8, 9 a.m. in the morning. And you'd look for their uh, cortisol levels and I'll go through this table in a minute. Um, but you'd also follow that up by a high dose of eight milligrams of dexamethasone as well. Same sort of method, give it at night and then check in the morning just to kind of help differentiate what the causes are. You'd also check the serum ACTH, which will help differentiate some of the causes and narrow it down. And then doing a CT head or abdo pelvis as well, depending on where you think the cause is. So to go through the um, table here, so you've got your low dose DEXA test um, and you're checking the cortisol level and the ACTH. ACTH you don't actually check um, typically for this but you check the cortisol at 9 a.m in the morning so you've given the DEXA at around midnight or so and you're checking in the morning now so if it's low then it's just normal there's there's no issue going on there because the dexamethasone will um, go and signal to so add to the negative feedback to the pituitary and the hypothalamus telling it not to produce ACTH and it will suppress the cortisol produced by the adrenal glands and that will remain low. If it's still high, then you would suspect Cushing syndrome because it means it's not been suppressed. 
So this is where you give the high dose of dexamethasone and then test it in the morning. So again, give it at midnight and then test it in the morning. If it's um, if the cortisol level is low, then you suspect pituitary because this high dose is enough to suppress any pituitary tumour. If it still remains high, then you know it's not in the pituitary gland and it's the tumour must be somewhere else or is some sort of ectopic. Um, so then this is where your ACTH measurements come in. So the cortisol is high and the ACTH is low, then you suspect that it's adrenal, an adrenal cause. If the cortisol high is high and the ACTH is also high, then you would think about an ectopic cause, so things like um, your small cell, lung cancers. Um, yeah. So in terms of management, if they are taking any steroids, then you'll stop that. Um, then you'll think about surgical treatment as well. So any um, transvenoidal, um, venoidal, sorry, um, resection or adrenalectomy um, to get rid of the tumour. You'd also think about chemo and radiotherapy here too. And then you, other things you can think about is medical treatment with cortisol inhibitors. So I've got two drugs here. Um, which are suggested for um, inhibiting cortisol production as well. So, next question here. We've got the Grandmaster from Sakar who's visiting Earth. During his stay, he becomes unwell and Dr. Strange decides to examine him. He notes the following. Skin looks unusually tanned, significant weight loss of about five kilos. The Grandmaster also reports he's been feeling slightly more fatigued has nausea and vomiting, feels lightheaded and has generalised muscle ache. Which of the tests would best help in the diagnosis of his symptoms? So if you can put down your option and also maybe put in a differential as well of what you think is going on. So you've got a couple of people saying Addison's and they put A as an option, which is correct. So well done. So I am trying to give you a bit of an Addisonian picture here. And the synactin test is the correct answer here. So well done, guys. So it's Addison's disease, so your clinical features, so you've got the tiredness, the weakness, the anorexia, weight loss. Um, you can also get postural hypertension, the salt craving as well nausea and vomiting, hyperpigmentation, you can sometimes get vitiligo as well, and this generalised muscle weakness, so myalgia. And investigations, your standard one is your short synactin test. So you check the baseline um, ACTH level, and then you give them the synactin, and then you measure the levels again at 30 and 60 minutes as well. And then you'd also check their serum cortisol levels at the same time. Clearly missing a slide here. Okay, so you would expect the synactin to help increase the cortisol. Okay, um, and if it doesn't, then there's an issue with the during your gland. Okay, so causes of Addison's disease. So the most common cause is actually TB. Um, you can also get autoimmune causes as well. Um, steroid withdrawal. If you quickly withdraw steroid you, um, that you're using, then you can end up um, having an Addisonian uh, picture, which is why it's very important to wean off steroids. Um, metastasis, any sort of infiltrates in the adrenal gland. Um, this Waterhouse Fredrickson disorder, so usually caused by um, Neisseria meningitis. Apoplexy, um, so that's quite common in a pregnancy um, when after giving birth. Um, then infections and any kind of enzyme deficit, so in congenital adrenal hyperplasia and things like that, and then drugs as well. Okay, so 
Dr. Strange is looking through the Grandmaster's investigations. Which of the following is likely to reflect the results for someone with Addison's? So take, I'll give you some time to just go through the table and pick your option. Give me about 10 more seconds and then I might just carry on. You've okay, got a C here. Got another C. And the answer is C. Well done, guys. So typically in Addison's, so you'll have a low serum cortisol. You have an elevated ACCH. It could, depending on the um, what's causing the Addison's disease, um, ACTH, ACTH can be low or high. But typical picture here is the low cortisol, the low sodium, and the kind of almost borderline or high potassium. Um, but the low sodium is a typical one that you'll see. And then other things you'll get is it's like acidotic picture, you get hypercalcemia, hypoglycemia, so the opposite of Cushing's. So in Cushing's you have increased um, glucose, whereas in Addison's it's less, so it reduce. Increased urea and creatinine. Um, and then you can get some changes in your full blood count as well, so eosinophilia and lymphocytosis. as well. Um, so I remember someone kind of giving me a good picture to remember for the Addison's. So you, you imagine someone with an empty packet of ready salted crisps, so the low sodium, and then very loads of bananas, so high potassium, looking very, very tired because they don't have enough energy and cortisol kind of helps boost you a little bit. Okay, and then management is typically steroid replacement, so giving them hydrocortisone or fludrocortisone as well, um, if you're suspecting kind of um, adrenal hyperplasia, which is also affecting your aldosterone production. Um, you can give them androgen replacement as well if there's any other causes, and then just in general, you'd want to counsel them about dose adjustments, especially when they're unwell, um, and just it's just lifelong kind of counselling and management for this. And you'd also want to kind of warn them about kind of tipping the other way and ending up with kind of a Cushingoid picture as well because they're taking steroids. And then at, at managing an Addisonian crisis, they'll need initial resuscitation. So IV hydrocortisone, so typically about 100 milligrams. Give them fluids as well because they'll be dehydrated. And then keep monitoring their blood sugars because they can be hypoglycemic. And then you'd want to just ensure they get, get cool, um, they get their steroids over about 24 hours, and they'll need to be weaned off this as well, um, just so they don't end up going back into an Addisonian crisis. And then I'm not going to go through this because these are very similar to your Addison's picture. Just the key bit is they'll come in look quite hypotensive um, and they might also have kind of sepsis, might be something like an infection or something that's tipped them over the edge. So you'd want to rule that out and also just do an ECG on them just to make sure there's no cardiac causes or any cardiac complications as well. Um, main reason for that is because of the electrolyte imbalance, so the hypercalemia. Um, mainly. Okay. And then I've just put this table in here, just 
kind of it going through the dexamethasone suppression test and also the synactin test, um, just for your reference. Um, again, you'll have access to that at the end. Um, and then quickly just going through congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is one of the causes of Addison's. So commonest form is usually a 21 hydroxylase deficiency, about 5% of um, 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. So if I'm sure a lot of you have seen this lovely diagram here, which I absolutely loathe. Um, so you've got your 21 hydroxylase here, which is the enzyme that's important in making your cortisol here, your glucocortisol. Um, glucocorticoids and your mineral mineralocorticoids here, so your aldosterone. So if this gets knocked out, you're not making any of this. And it also kind of pushes you towards this way, producing all the other hormones down here. Um, most importantly, it kind of produces more testosterone, which is why you'll end up with clinical features such as virilization in females, Hirschism as well, um, premature adenarche and infertility. Um, and this can also happen, in, you'll get sort of ambiguous genitalia in males as well sometimes, depending on the severity. Um, and because they're not producing any aldosterone either, um, they'll have this salt losing crisis, hyperkalemia, because aldosterone is what helps get rid of the potassium. And then they'll be hypotensive and hypoglycemic as well. Um, and then dehydration and vomiting are some of the other um, features as well here. So the management is quite similar. Um, so steroids, again, you'd also do the aldosterone replacement here, definitely. So give them the food or cortisol. Um, then IV and electrolyte. Um, balancing, making uh, IV fluids and electrolyte management as well, just making sure you um, chop up their potassium and ensure that the sodium levels are managed as well. And then you might also want to have a urology input for um, and those babies with ambiguous genitalia just, um, just to make sure that they kind of they might just do a surgical um, management for that. And then counselling for sick days again and just monitoring for signs of Cushing syndrome. And then investigation wise, it's just you can do the short synactin simulation test, but you'd want to check for these enzymes as well. And also do a serum cortisol and just do a pelvic and adrenal ultrasound as well and check the plasma renin levels too. So the next condition I'm going to go through is Conn syndrome. So this is going the other way, where you've got an excessive production of aldosterone. So in this case, your potassium level is going to shoot up and your sodium levels are going to come down um, because of this. So just a little revision here. So your aldosterone here detects um, your, sorry, went the wrong way. So your, ados, your adrenal cortex detects the rise in uh, potassium and the fall in your sodium. And then that then stimulates the production of aldosterone, which then um, reduces the um, potassium by excreting it. And then sodium is reabsorbed in the kidneys to increase the sodium levels. So with Conn syndrome, you've got a fall in your potassium and then an increase in your sodium levels. Um, so you can end up being kind of hypertensive, um, which can also end up leading to like end organ issues, so CKD, heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, um, so any like strokes, things like that, um, and then retinopathy and just things like MI as well is a complication. Um, other symptoms usually like headaches, lethargy, mood disturbances, muscle cramps, paresthesia, and then you can have polyuria and polynocturia as well. Um, and then just I've just listed some causes here as well. So 
a lot of them. So you've got your adenomas, so you've got bilateral adenomas that you can get, it can be unilateral or just aldosterone producing ones, um, unilateral hyperplasia, bilateral hyperplasia as well, and then familial kind of causes as well. Management for this is investigating your aldosterone renin ratios. Um, so if your aldosterone is a lot higher, then you'd worry about that. And then urinary sodium and serum sodium and serum potassium levels to ensure that. Um, so your urinary sodium would be low, your serum sodium would be higher and your serum potassium would be much lower. And then do a CT of the adrenal glands as well. And then treatment is spironolactone or epilaronone. Um, you can also consider amyloride. Um, then you'd also want to give them potassium supplements, so either Sandok okay or if they need, you'll give them IV replacement. And then treatment of the primary tumour, so either surgical, mostly surgical resection of it. Okay, so got another SBA here. So we're almost at the end, so hang in. Yeah. Um, so you've got Star Lord who um, got re reoccurring anxiety attacks. He's had a few episodes of lightheadedness, tremors, palpitations, whilst trying to defeat Thanos, causing him to make silly decisions. He usually needs to take a breather until he calms down. He also become, has become more constipated over time. He mentions that he has a history of cancer to Dr. Strange, but it doesn't think it's relevant. What is the likely um, diagnosis? Sorry, that's meant to be family history of cancer. So put your um, answers in the chat. Okay, so you've got a few C's here. So yeah, it's a pheochromocytoma. Well done, guys. So this is kind of your typical presentation of your pheochromocytoma, where um, you've got you got the excessive production of adrenaline. So it's almost like your hypothyroid kind of picture where they're kind of anxious, got these tremors, palpitations, but they're usually able to calm down a bit. So the, the tumour itself is of the enterochromophin cells in the adrenal medulla, so this bit here. Um, and that's producing all these catecholamines, so your adrenaline and your noradrenaline. Um, so this excess is what's giving you this clinical presentation. Then you've got the rule of tens here. I don't know how much of this is true anymore, but this is what we I remember learning and it was quite easy to remember. So 10% are uh, potentially malignant, 10% tend to be bilateral tumours, 10% can be extra adrenal and there's a 10% chance of it being familial and then they also present very similar to paragangliomas so um, tumours of the ganglions in um, uh, which also produces like which has your adre um, adrenaline receptors in there and then it's also associated with MEN2, which Emily mentioned before. Um, got your von Hippel Lindau syndrome and your neurofibromatosis fibromatosis type 1. So, anyone with um, sort of family history of this or any kind of known diagnosis of this, you'd want to look out for for your chromocytomas as well. So, you got your kind of classic triad of clinical features. So, it's kind of episodic pounding headaches palpitations or tachycardia and sweating or you kind of especially in a young person um, you'd be worried about this um, the other thing is it could be an incidental finding usually in autopsies whether they've been asymptomatic the whole time and when you're doing like a post-mortem you just happen to find it um, and then just listed all the other kind of clinical features here as well um, and then if you've got like a hypertensive crisis you'd, um, from your pheochromocytoma, they'll be like confused, they'll have their end organ dysfunction as well. They'll be hyper very hypertensive 
and hypothermic, so pyrexic. So, for Dr. Strange, who decides to investigate our Lord's condition, which of these tests is the least useful for his diagnosis? So, none of the tests are useless, it's just one of them you don't really need to look at specifically when you're diagnosing this condition. We've got one person saying A here. Just wait a few more seconds for any other answers that are coming in. Okay, so the answer is actually E, your creatinine clearance. So it is important, but it's not the most important in terms of diagnosing um, this condition. So checking the catalytic means in the urine and serum is quite important because um, you want to look at the excretion of it um, and the production of it as well. Checking the glucose levels because adrenaline can kind of end up making um, them hyperglycemic and also their blood pressure because they'll be hypertensive. Okay. So you check the urinary metanephrines and catecholamines. So the metanephrines are usually your, um, they're the me metabolic products after the breakdown of catecholamines. And then you'll check serum metanephrines. Um, you can also check the serum catecholamines to make sure they're not elevated. And then you'd want to do a CT or MRI of the um adrenal glands and the kidneys and just do a general like abdo pelvis as well to identify any kind of mets as well and then these are additional images which i've noted down um so you got your meta iodobenzoguanine um scan and then you got your a pet scan here as well which i'm not sure how it works but um these help kind of identify a female pheochromocytoma um Management ultimately is usually a surgical reception, uh, resection. You'd want to manage their blood pressure as well. So you've got your alpha blockers, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers as options here. Um, Metatyrosine, sorry, which inhibits your catecholamine synthesis to help kind of dampen that down. You'd advise a high salt diet as well, um, which seems counterintuitive, but because they've got this kind of salt wasting, you'd want to kind of give them the high salt diet and then radiotherapy as well, just to help with the uh, tumour, um, just to get rid of the tumour as well. And then your complications here are your, you can get cardiomyopathy, um, hypersensitive crisis, which you kind of covered before, arrhythmias, type 2 diabetes, because they're hyper, they end up being hyperglycemic, um, they can end up with cerebral vascular disease, so strokes, for example, or any kind of cerebral hemorrhages um, because of their hypertensive state. They can develop seizures as well. And post-surgical, they can have recurrence or they can also end up with adrenal insufficiency. So they'll tip, end up in kind of with an Addisonian picture, but then needs to be treated accordingly. Cool. So that is the end. So thank you for sticking this long. Um, I've put the QR code here for the feedback form and I'll just quickly put it in the chat too. Um, I've also put our email up there in case anyone wants to email um, any questions that you think of later on. Um, but yeah, thank you for sticking around.